Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody has said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you rise up as we pray together? Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we bless your name for the life you have given us, for the chance you have given us, and for the ministry that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, because you have gathered us together as leaders in your church. And we have come together in this Leadership Strategy Congress. Lord, how strategic is this? That you brought us together to train us, to develop us, and to move us on. Lord, we pray that you put your power in our lives more than ever before at this time in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, the attitude of the minister and the power in the minister and the love in the minister and the commitment in the minister, Lord, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. I will pray that this year will be a new year of new service. And that Lord will be our best for you and draw souls into the kingdom, even this year more than ever before, in Jesus' name. Be glorified and exalted in every one of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted as i told you earlier the lord jesus christ our savior our lord our king our master and the great teacher the prince of all teachers here he comes to teach us he comes to instruct us he comes to lead us into the path into the way of blessedness I'm coming back to verse 1 and seeing the multitude and he saw the multitude when we stand up today and we see the multitude we see them in the physical how short how tall maybe how fat maybe how moderate in stature sometimes we also see the emotion from the from the facial appearance because your face actually tells a lot of story about the man, about the woman. Because you see what comes from the heart is mirrored out in the face. And you as a preacher, you cannot be looking down all the time when you're preaching. Neither can you be looking at the ceiling all the time you're preaching. You're not preaching to the ground, neither are you preaching to the ceiling. You see the people and Jesus saw the multitude. And even though we are not Jesus, yet you can see the constraints on man. You can see the depression on man. You can see the fear in man. And you can see that on the facial appearance. And then that helps you to be able to minister to the people. But when it says Jesus saw the multitude, he saw more than what we can see. He saw their faith. He saw their tradition. He saw their thoughts. He saw their misgivings. He saw their emotions. He saw their plans. He saw their receptivity. He saw their rejection. He saw everything about them. If you do not see people, how do you minister to them? You must know people. You must see people. And then the Lord will be able to give you the appropriate ministry to give unto them. And then he went up into a mountain yes i know that i told you about that before i'm telling you now you need to be separated a little bit from the people and look up here do you see how the pulpit is and it's not because i'm preaching when you are preaching to you that's how you are separated not only that you are higher than the people you are separated you are withdrawn away from the people you see the minister of the gospel the minister or the teacher of the word of god yes he must be with the people he must interact with the people i sat where the people sat ezekiel said i felt what he felt ezekiel said but there comes a time that you need to separate from the people and you leave some distance between you and the people and do you know that when you're too close you don't see very well if you get too close you will not see what you need to see if you become part of the crowd therefore as a preacher as a minister of the gospel you come far a little bit and the farther you come not too far not too far but the farther you come the more you are able to see 
he saw them and then he went up to the mountain and then when he was set if he had notes to use the notes were there and if he had any references to use the references were there how can you come and then the notes are not set the teaching is not set the instructions are not set and the things you want to give they are not orderly they are not put together in a coherent form he was set the teaching was set the stage was set everything was set now ready to talk to them and his disciples came unto him those disciples what did they come they came to learn haven't they learned before you know the quality of a disciple is that i want to know more i want to learn more i want to see more i want to hear more i want to get deeper and i want to get higher into the things of god that's why they came i showed you in chapter four how he went to them and was preaching to them come unto me i'll make you fishers of men they have heard before you are ate before you want to eat again you've drunk water before you want to drink again that's the sign of being alive when we are dead no desire anymore to drink no desire anymore to eat no desire anymore to learn when we're still alive a disciple that is alive he wants to learn more that's how you know that you're still alive if if it comes to your life that you said what i learned in chapter four what i learned before isn't that enough it's a sign of decay and a sign of death but a sign of being alive is that i want more that's why they came and he opened his mouth that word open if you follow the word open with the lord jesus christ he opened their understanding he opened the scriptures he opened his mouth he opened everything before them you know when jesus came he didn't close up he didn't close to close the revelation and to close the book and to close the instruction he kept on opening it opening it open your mouth open the scriptures open their understanding and be like jesus and then he taught them he didn't entertain them he taught them he didn't play with them he taught them he didn't excite them he taught them Do you know there are people that all they are for is only for drama there's no teaching it's only entertainment there's no teaching but he opened his mouth and he taught them what we're learning from the lord jesus christ how we ought to teach and put instruction and doctrine and teaching into the lives into the hearts of the people and he said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven now it says blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are they that mourn there was neither sorrow nor mourning before sin entered into this world go back to the garden of eden you saw only joy happiness health energy courage purpose for living but when sin came in that's when sorrow came in that's when death came in that's when suffering came in and with these came mourning you see people that mourn today and the likelihood is somebody died in the family and that death will result into mourning and you see personal sin cuts us away from the life of god and when there is personal sin there's going to be mourning not only that there is suffering and that brings mourning when somebody is suffering and suffering and suffering he mourns it's like why is it with me like this trouble here trial there difficulty there headache there heartache there it's not happy it's mourning and so physical or spiritual death of loved ones will bring mourning and sorrow in our hearts 
but the coming of Christ has brought forgiveness, has brought salvation for sinners, and joy and happiness for the sorrowful, hope for the hopeless, encouragement and upliftment for those in despair and comfort for mourners. That's what leads us to the message of Jesus Christ at this hour. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, causes that means reason. C A U S E S. Causes, reasons of heart breaking mourning. What do people mourn? What are the reasons? What's the cause? Causes, reasons of heart breaking mourning. Number two, confession of humble mourners. Confession of humble mourners number three comfort for honest mourners comfort for honest mourners number one the causes the reasons for heartbreaking mourning come back to matthew chapter 5 verse 4 blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted and let us start with this in the world they say it's a sign of sickness it's a sign of weakness rather if you mourn if you cry if you shed tears in fact the people of the world when they want to behave like they are strong strong in their mind and strong in their will and strong in their emotion and strong in their personality one of the signs is that you never cry and you find a man that says, as you see me, I don't know how to cry. Even when my father died, or when my mother died, or when somebody precious in the family died, I didn't know how to cry. I'm strong. There are people that train themselves never, never, never to mourn. They might have reverses. They might have calamities. They might have difficulties, but they train themselves never to show any sign of money because to them, money is a sign of weakness. But you know, Jesus doesn't talk like that. Those people are different from Jesus. But Jesus said, there is money. And then he says, that blessed are they that mourn. Rather than saying they are hopeless, they're weak they don't have any spine they don't have any backbone and their personalities are not well developed it is the child in them that's what the psychologists say it's the child in them that is playing it out again making them to mourn but you know jesus christ of course he did not even weep for himself when he was going to the cross he bore the cross because he knew this is the will of the father but he looked over jerusalem and he went over jerusalem 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 if you had known at this hour what belongs to your peace but they are hidden away from your eyes he mourned for them he came to the grave of lazarus and then when he saw mary and martha mourning and weeping he groaned in his spirit and then jesus wept yes there is mourning and jesus christ said blessed are they that mourn and the blessedness is this because the almighty god himself will comfort them isaiah chapter 59 isaiah chapter 59 i'm reading from verse 11 we roar all like bears we mourn like doves we look for judgment but there is none for salvation but it is far from us that's why they mourn they said we are mourning like the doves why are you mourning because we're looking for judgment we're looking for justice and there is no justice there's no judgment and we're looking for salvation and it is far away from us for our transgressions are multiplied before thee and our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us and as for our iniquities we know them in transgressing and lying against the lord and departing away from our god speaking oppression and revolt conceiving and uttering from their heart the words of falsehood 
and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is falling in the street and equity cannot enter that's why they mourn you see when there is sin and when sin multiplies in the midst of the people of god there must be mourning in exodus chapter 33 exodus chapter 33 we're reading from verse 1 exodus 33 verse 1 and the lord said unto moses depart and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of egypt unto the land which i swear unto abraham to isaac to jacob saying unto thy seed will i give it and i will send an angel before thee and i will drive out the canaanites and the amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the hivites and the jebusites unto the land or to a land flowing with milk and honey for i will not go up in the midst of thee think about that look up here for a moment the lord god almighty in heaven had promised israel the nation the canaan canaan land and he said i'm taking you out of egypt and i'm taking you through the wilderness and you're going to go to the promised land and then in exodus chapter 32 they disobeyed the lord they went into idol worship and eventually moses prayed for them and god said all right i'll not destroy them physically land of canaan that's physical play with me honey that's physical i give it to them i told abraham i told isaac i told jacob i'm going to give them the land i give it to them but now i'm going to send an angel with them i myself the lord almighty i cannot be in their midst because they are rebellious disobedient stiff necked people let them go ahead you know it's like your wife telling you that well my husband with what is happening in this family I will not divorce. I'll cook your food. I'll iron your clothes. I'll make the bed. I'll clean the room. But my heart, my affection, I keep it to myself. Although the food is there, although the money is there, although the house is there, the woman is saying, Yes, I know I'm tied down with you. And I'm not going to leave you. But you're not going to have my love. You're not going to have my affection. If the man understands what marriage is, he knows that that is a heartbreaking message. And so God said, I give you land, go and take it. To protect you in the wilderness, I'm a faithful God, I'll protect you. I will send an angel with you, but I myself will not go with you. Look at the attitude. You know, those who don't understand will say, all right, if, uh, if we're still going to have the land, no problem if an angel is going to go with us and he's going to defeat the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and we're still going to have everything that we're begging for that's all right if you say you are not going with us almighty God and you give us a substitute praise the Lord land of Canaan is our goal they didn't do like that they knew there was a serious problem here look at it in verse 3 unto a land flowing with milk and honey for i will not go up in the midst of thee for thou art a stiff-necked people lest i consume you in the way and when the people had these evil tidings they mourned that's the reason for mourning that's the reason for being sorrowful that's the reason for saying no lord we understand you are a holy god you are a righteous god you have said what you ought to say we mourn when we see that the presence of god himself is absent from us even though the provisions are there are you going to exchange the provision with the presence of the almighty god that's why they mourn for then it says and no man did put on his ornament and then we're told in joel chapter 2 joel we're reading from chapter 2 reading from verse 12 Joel chapter 2 verse 12 again telling us about the reason and the causes for mourning therefore also now says the Lord to ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning 
Jesus spoke about money. Almighty God spoke about money. Rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And repented him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink covering unto the Lord your God. That's why they mourn. Because they saw sin had come in. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. That one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. You see, when there is sin in the congregation, there is no reason to be puffed up, to still be excited, and to be going about happy and joyful and excited and laughing. You know, some people say that's just my nature. That's the wrong nature. If there is sin, if there's something dishonoring the Lord in your congregation, if there is fornication, if there is pregnancy before marriage, and then it's becoming a common trend in your congregation, and then you go about, and then you, when you come to the pulpit, praise the Lord, hallelujah, God is still on the throne. We know he's on the throne, but not in that congregation. And therefore it says, and you have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed may be taken away from among you. It calls for mourning when there is sin in the congregation in second corinthians chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 7 second corinthians chapter 7 reading from verse 7 and not by his coming only but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire your mourning yes in that corinthian church with your fervent mind towards me so that i rejoice the more for though i made you sorry with a letter i do not repent though i did repent for i perceive that the same epistle that has made you sorry though it were but for a season now i rejoice not that she were made sorry but that ye sorrowed to repentance for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation godly sorrow that's the morning that's the morning when you mourn like that because of sin that has come in that godly sorrow walketh repentance unto salvation not to be regretted of not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world walketh death as we talk about the causes of money with all the scriptures that we have read how can we summarize that part personal sin personal sin when it's personal sin and you realize that the devil just puts your back on the ground and flood you you are careless and now you found yourself in the degradation in the death of sin and you said me i preach salvation i preach righteousness i preach holiness i've even preached to the point to say satan can never get me because by the grace of god i depend on this on changing on failing grace of god but now satan got you because of personal sin, there have been mourning. Psalm 38. In Psalm 38, reading from verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of thy sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As an heavy body, they're too heavy for me. My wounds sting. And are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Personal sin causes mourning. Number two, the people's sin. The people's sin. Maybe you have not seen yourself, but the people you are leading, the people you are guiding, 
the people you are helping to understand what eternal life is all about they're going to see him and it appears that they don't even have the mind to come out of it at all it causes mourning the people's sin jeremiah chapter 13 verse 17 jeremiah chapter 13 verse 17 but if you will not hear it my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride if you will not hear you'll not hear the warning of god you'll not hear the invitation of god calling you back come back out of the far country that the prodigal son the prodigal daughter has gone if ye will not hear my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride and mine eye shall we sore and run down with tears because the lord's flock has carried away captive number three the princess sin that is a scene of the prince the scene of the prince the prince of the king the prince of the leader it is the scene of the leader the scene of a minister that causes you to mourn number one personal scene number two the people's scene number three the princess scene we're looking at her for samuel chapter 15 for samuel chapter 15 and we're looking at the scene of the prince and then we're looking at what it caused this great man of god in first samuel chapter 15 verse 24 for samuel chapter 15 verse 24 and saul said unto samuel i have sinned for i have transgressed the commandment of the lord and i was because i feared the people and obeyed their voice that's the prince among the people and what he did do he sinned and then we're told in verse 35 verse 35 and samuel came no more to see saul until the day of his death nevertheless samuel mourned for saul samuel mourned for saul when you see any leader in the church a leader of a state a leader of a, a leader of a nation a leader of a region a leader of a local government a leader of a local church a leader of a district when you see a leader among the people of god that goes to sin and is warned and is called to correction and then he remains adamant in that sin you mourn the princess sin causes mourning number four perpetual sinning perpetual sinning when the sin just remains there and it's like there's nothing we can do about it it has come it has come will you not repent i'm not thinking about that are you not going to change we're not thinking about that that's not in our mind when the sin becomes perpetual there is money there ought to be money Hosea chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1 Hosea chapter 4 verse 1 hear the words of the lord ye children of israel for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn. When the sin becomes perpetual and there is no righteousness anywhere, and there is no breaking of the conscience it's like the conscience is adjusted and the conscience is now acclimatized adjusted to the sinning and the sinning become perpetual it says therefore the land mourn and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the bees of the field and with the fowls of heaven yea the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away yet let no man strive nor reprove another for thy people are as they that strive with the priest you know the people when they are adamant in sin it's like now it's a personal personal conflict between them between the people and the priest and instead of understanding that sin brings the judgment of god and that sin brings the uh, the anger the indignation and the wrath and the judgment of god upon the land when there is sin it's like now it's a personal sin between the people and the priest for the people are like they that strive with the priest then number five when there's predicted suffering predicted suffering that is when the lord now sends a prophet and he predicts like okay because now you are adamant in sin 
and because you've made up your mind you're never going to bend you're never going to turn you want to continue in this evil way and there is suffering prophesied and predicted because of that it's going to be morning first kings chapter 21 first kings chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 21 behold i will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy, thy posterity and will cut off from ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in israel look at the results and the and the attitude of ahab in verse 27 and it came to pass when ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes he put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. He mourned. You see, when there's predicted suffering, when God Almighty said, Well, I'm a God of mercy. I'm a God of love. I'm a God of blessing. But I don't bless rebellion. I don't bless disobedience. I don't bless deliberate sinning against me. And when you do that, and you feel that now God will change his standard of requirement of holiness and righteousness, and God has to be weaker than man, and man becomes so strong as to say, this evil I want to perpetrate, I'll keep on doing it. And then God sends a prophet and he says, hey, listen, I dealt with Pharaoh, you're not the first one. I dealt with all those people, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. You're not the first one. Hey, pay attention. Achan tried it. I dealt with him. Who are you? Ahab. Now, it's your turn. I'll deal with you. And when Ahab had that, and he saw that the suffering was prophesied and predicted, he went subtly. He went to the ground. He said, Lord, I'm sorry. You mentioned Pharaoh. Pharaoh is stronger than I am. And Korah, Data, and Abiram, those, that's a team. I'm just an individual. Lord, please, don't do what you are saying. A wage, morning. When there's predicted suffering, morning will follow. Number six. Number six, when there's prolonged sickness. Protracted sickness. When the sickness is just there. And you are not dying, you are not living. And the sickness just goes on from bad to worse. There is mourning as well in Psalm 88. Psalm 88, I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 88, verse 9. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? And thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? And thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, in the morning. Shall my prayer prevent thee? Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I'm distracted. Thy fierce wrath goes over me. Thy terrors have caught me up. And you see this man because of the protracted sickness and the affliction upon him that's why he mourned number seven painful separation painful separation when there's separation and it's a painful separation husband and wife the separation has come and then when you are together you didn't feel the presence of one another but now there's a painful separation or it may be that you know it's uh, the lord was going away and was telling his own disciples i'll be going away and then they were mourning now because of this painful separation john chapter 16 in john chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 5 john 16 verse 5 but now i go my way to him that sent me and none of you asketh me whither goest thou 
but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The painful separation between Christ and his disciples cause sorrow, mourning in their hearts. You understand then why we mourn? We mourn because of all these reasons. And the Lord is saying, when there's that kind of mourning, that there will be comfort. Come back to Matthew chapter 5, and I come back to point number 2, the confession of humble mourners. The confession of humble mourners. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. How wonderful it is that there may be one reason for mourning. And then the day, all of them, they that mourn, Maybe you are mourning because of personal sin. You are part of them. Maybe you are mourning because of the people's sin. The sin in your congregation. That's it. They that mourn. Maybe you are mourning because of the prince's sin. The person that brought you to Christ. The person that brought you to the Lord. A prince in the land. A leader in the land. A king in the land. A preacher in the land. A person that was a source of encouragement to you before. And now he's come back into sin. Maybe he has not gone away from the congregation, but he's gone back into sin and his usefulness is not like it, it used to be. I said, that's my leader. That's my, that's my king. I look at Jesus, I look at him. It was a great encouragement to me, but now he's gone into sin and he's not having any plan as yet of returning back to his first love. You mourn and blessed are they that mourn. Not just one person, maybe there's perpetual sinning. And you see that there's a group of people you don't know what you are going to do with them. Maybe it's a section in your local church. And that local, that section is just, you know, they just, you know, they demolish all the standards. And they uproot all the, all the, all the landmarks. And to them it doesn't matter. It's like their ministry is to uproot the landmarks that our fathers have said. You have spoken. You have corrected. You have chastised. You have disciplined, you have preached, you have prayed, you have fasted, yet they want to do what they do. Of course, they will mourn. And it says, Blessed are they that mourn. And when you are part of the people like that and you are mourning, they that mourn, it said, All of them, they shall be comforted. Or it may be because of this prolonged sickness. Prolonged sickness. Maybe it's your mother, maybe it's your father, maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your husband, maybe it's your child. And every time you see this sickness on the child, I've carried this child to crusade, I've carried this child everywhere, and I've been, I, I don't know what to do again. And Lord, how can I bear see my child suffer like this? He is not dying. I thank God he's born again. My child is a child of God. And if he died, then he will go to heaven. And I can't kill him. Because that will be a great sin against the Almighty God. And every time I see him pining away in this kind of sickness, it is a dagger in my heart. I wish I myself would take over the sickness and be sick instead of this, my child. You mourn. But thank God, God will comfort you. Yeah. That child will get well in Jesus' name. Because blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Or it may be there is painful separation painful separation the, the man you love that's your husband and i'm going somewhere because of a little thing that happened in the family and now he's gone and then maybe he phoned from there don't expect me enough is enough i can't bear all these uh, all these idiosyncrasies and all these peculiarities all these eccentricities i can't bear it anymore i'm gone I know that i cannot marry again but that's all right go your way i go my way and now you you suddenly realize I should have been more gentle on this man. You suddenly realize I should have just given him a little bit. And not allowed to come to this point, to come to this head. There is now a separation between us. And when I think about it now, and I look back at the situation of what happened, you know, just a little self-denial. And just a little, a little understanding, a little endurance could have saved this marriage. And now, although you are a child of God, you mourn because of that painful separation. But thank God you are here today. I have good news for you. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be 
comforted. You will be comforted in Jesus' name. The confession of the humble mourners in uh, Psalm 38. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 38, reading from verse 6, from verse 1 to verse 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither ch chasing me, chastise me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me so. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. You see the confession there? The confession of humble mourners. Is there any other adjective to use for mourners? Can we talk of proud mourners? Can we talk of happy mourners? Can we talk of excited mourners? No. The mourners are low in the dust. And they are humble. They are lowly. They even feel humiliated. Humble mourners. Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto thy mo the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest for behold I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold thou desirest truth in the inward past and in the hidden past thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me with Esau and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. The confession of mourners, humble mourners. For a confession to be noticed, acceptable, responded to, it must be sincere, it must be heartfelt, it must be humble, it must be honest. You know, Pharaoh said, I have sinned, God didn't take note. Saul said, I have sinned, God didn't pay attention. Balaam said, I have sinned, it still went on in his perversion. Judas Iscariot said, I have seen a betrayed innocent blood. He still died without forgiveness, without grace. He can confess, I have seen. He didn't receive forgiveness or favor from the leader in Israel. They were not sincere. They were not repentant. But when the mourner is sincere, honest, humble, then it will be noticed and acceptable in the sight of God. Point number three, comfort for honest mourners comfort for honest mourners Matthew chapter 5 we're reading from verse 4 Matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 4 in Matthew chapter 5 verse 4 blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted there's comfort for honest mourners comfort for honest mourners as you look at Isaiah chapter 12 Isaiah chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 12, reading from verse 1. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Angry with me. All, Almighty God was angry because of sin. Of course, you know that 
God is angry with the sinner every day. Sinning brings judgment, brings wrath, brings indignation, brings the heavy hand of God upon them, upon the sinner. But then when there is repentance, there is a turning around. When there is sincere mourning before the Lord, he turned away his anger. And now the mourner is comforted. Behold, in verse 2, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my son. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the well of salvation. And that's the comfort that we have right there. Isaiah chapter 51, I'm reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 51, reading from verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make a wilderness like Eden. I thought you would say amen. amen. And her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Verse 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come. With singing unto Zion. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. And they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning. Shall flee away. I, even I am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die. And of the son of man that shall be made as grass. Do you see the comfort of the Lord then for the people of God? Well, uh, the comfort here, uh, that's one thing. And God has abundantly promised that he's going to comfort us even here in this life. And if you are sorrowful about anything at all, the Lord will comfort you. Yeah. Personal sin, the Lord will forgive you. And the people sin, the Lord will forgive them and turn them around. And the princes uh, sin, the Lord will turn that leader, will turn that man around. And then new life will come again. And then he'll come back into the place he used to be with God. Perpetual sinning among the people. The Almighty God is able to forgive, is able to turn around, and is able to revive and make a mighty change in the lives of the people. But then you have comfort here, and we're going to have comfort all in eternity. In Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crowns which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lit up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham have mercy upon me. And send Lazarus that he may dip his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus evil things. Nah, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. He is comforted. He is comforted. There's an everlasting comfort. When we get over on the other side, all the water under the bridge, gone. All the sorrow, gone. All the heartache, gone. All the troubles, gone. All the temptation, gone. And just like that, in a moment of time, we cross over to this side. And then we look back. No more sorrow. No more sickness. And no more affliction, and no more curse, and no more heartache, and Satan is not there to torment or trouble anymore. See yourself, you are now in the kingdom, and there is no way for Satan to pull you back anymore. Comfort upon comfort, eternal comfort, everlasting comfort, and then all the Almighty God Himself will take is the handkerchief of heaven and then wipe away all your tears. What a comfort I want to be there.
why don't you rise up and tell the Lord you want to be there whatever may be happening to you whatever you may be passing through today that you are crying that you are mourning remember a time is coming when God will comfort all his own because Lazarus eventually became comforted and when we pass on to the other side there's that comfort for every one of us talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord here am I if you have any personal sin you mourn you repent you hum humble yourself because of that and God will comfort you and forgive you maybe it's your wife maybe it's your husband you're not happy with the situation at home or situation in your local church yes there's mourning but there's comfort for those who mourn